Before I begin, I just wanted to dedicate a shear that this year should be a blessing and a merit for the health and success of the families of uh, uh, Regina Bas Yosef Ruvain and Yeshaya Ben Yisrael, Benjamin Wolf, Ben Tzvi Hersh, and Baruch Ben Benjamin Wolf. They should all have a uh, tremendous schus because of the shear. You know, we notice that every Jewish holiday, it's an interesting question, you know, every Jewish holiday has obviously some basis in a historical event. We know that, right? And then we, you know, if you go through all the Jewish holidays, Yom Tov, uh, and so on, and even the fast days, they're all connected in some way to an event. That's either in the Torah or the event came later, and as a result of that, Chazal, whatever, for whatever reason, decided that they want to make it a special day of uh, commemoration or celebration. But the only day, or Yom Tov actually, that seems to defy that rule uh, is Rosh Hashanah. You know, I mean, it's true that Rosh Hashanah was the uh, birth of the world, right? The world was first created on Rosh Hashanah, actually six days before, which is the 25th day of Elul, we know that, you know. But uh, the creation of the world isn't a particular Jewish event, you know. And therefore we can ask a question, what is Rosh Hashanah commemorating, really? What is it all about? Like I said, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with a Jewish event. Because Adam Mauritian obviously wasn't Jewish. He was a man, a human being, it's called Minhu Anushi, you know, the human species, but he wasn't Jewish. Avram Avinu was the first Jew. So we can all ask a question, what does it really commemorate? You see. And uh, the truth is, so that's one question <coughs> we can ask. Uh, another question that we can ask, actually, is what is the essence of Rosh Hashanah, you see? What exactly is it for? I mean, we do have a mitzvah of shofar, but I will explain why do we have the mitzvah of shofar. What does shofar do, you know, and so on. So the, f the second question we can ask is what is the essence of Rosh Hashanah. And as we will see, something very surprising. Most people think it's a Yom Hadin, which ostensibly that's what it looks like, but not really. As you will delve into the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, you're going to see that Rosh Hashanah is very different. Uh, and that is that Yom Hadin is a very narrow understanding, uh, a day of judgment, is a very narrow understanding of Rosh Hashanah, as we will see. So in a certain sense, obviously, it is din, it is judgment, but that's a narrow understanding. Truth is, it's much more profound and uh, much more, maybe I use the word vital, you see, in all the uh, cycle of the Yom Tov and so on. Also, you know, you begin to think about Rosh Hashanah and how is it possible that there's one judgment day a year? Like, does that make sense, really? Imagine if New York City had only one day that the courts were in session, right? And the other days of the year, no courts. <coughs> what would it be like? Well, it would be like what it is today, full of crime. Tragically, and so on, you know? But, uh, so what's the logic? How can a... How can a, a civilization, or a city, or whatever, have only one day when the court is open? That's rather bizarre, if you think about it, you know. Also, we know that it says, Kol Bo Oilom, in the prayer of Unisan et Toikev, right, Kol Bo Oilom, it says, everybody's judged, even Malachim tremble, everything is judged. But it's very hard to understand that, why? Because Judgment only comes if you have free will and you are therefore responsible for your acts. 
makes sense. So you're judged for what you chose, and there are consequences. But there are many things that do not have free will. Animals don't have free will. Insects don't have free will, you see. And even if you think about it, angels don't really have free will either. So what does it mean that everything is judged? Very difficult to understand what that means. Also, okay, let's assume there's a judgment day. Why is it on the first day of a Tishrei, Aleph Tishrei, which is Rosh Chodesh? Why is it on Aleph Tishrei? Truthfully, it could have been any day of the year, right? Could have qualified to be a judgment day, if that's what it is. So why is it Aleph Tishrei? That is the question. You see. Also, what is very difficult to understand is imagine that you are charged with some type of uh, crime, let's say murder, right? And there's the day of judgment, the court date, right, is going to be on a certain time. Would you celebrate that day? Would that be a Yom Tov for you? Of course not. How could it be a Yom Tov when you're being judged whether you will live or die? or sit in prison for 20, 30 years, 40 years, or not. How could Rosh Hashanah be a Yom Tov, a day when we celebrate or commemorate? And we do. We all know that. We all have a Suda, a meal, a festive, and it's a festive meal. We're not talking here about, you know, a pizza, a pizza pie or something like that. Although I imagine for some people that is a festive meal. But in any case, right, could be. But anyway, especially the way they make pizza today, with extra cheese, by the way. Anyway, uh, so it's interesting, you know, why is it a Yom Tov? How could, how could it be a Yom Tov? Yet, I don't, you know, you walk into somebody's house, right? Or, you know, you're invited to somebody's meal, uh, Rosh Hashanah and so on, right? I don't see anybody really anxious there. I mean, they don't look like they're being judged the next day. Uh, yet we have meals which are Yom Tov. We celebrate. See, what is the logic of that? There's something that doesn't add up here, you see. How could it be a day of judgment and the judgment is concerning what? It examines basically your deeds of the entire previous year, right? And it judges whether you will live or die. Achaim Vamoras. It's really what it is. So how come nobody looks like they're being judged? for living or dying. That, that's a very uh, mysterious kind of behavior that takes place on Rosh Hashanah. So obviously there's something that we don't really either understand, uh, you know, and, and, and obviously it needs a tremendous explanation. Also, <clears throat> we know that we blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah. In fact, that is the real mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah, shofar, right? Why? I mean, it sounds nice. It's almost like a musical interlude, you know, if I have to say so, you know. But what's the concept of shofar? Now, there are explanations. I think Rav Sadia Goin gives ten reasons, you know. It reminds us of Matan Torah when they blew the shofar and gave us the Torah, <coughs> right? So there are many symbolic ideas behind shofar but is there a much is there a more profounder concept of why the rabbinism would have us blow the shofar very powerful question also the, the main there's a chazal actually it's a mishnah the main prayers is the musaf prayer of rosh hashanah and it has three distinct themes it's called Malchiois, where we pronounce psukim, verses of kingship, that God is king. Okay, then we have Zichroinus, where we ask God to remember our former good deeds and so on, you know. And then we have Shefaris, where you have many psukim that talk about the Shefa. Why? What is the logic and the importance of those three themes for which we will mention many psukim for each one, at least 10 of them or whatever. 
Also, Chazal tell us that the sounds of the shofar, we have uh, three types. We have the tekiah, which is the long blast, right? Then we have the shvarim, which is uh, three sound, three short sounds. Then we have the uh, uh, trua, which is like a, teka, a staccato, you know, which is a, a series of very short blasts, you know. Why? Why those three? You know, they're obviously three different sounds. They're not just three different uh, blasts, but they're actually different sounds in the sense that um, they seem to uh, symbolize something. What is that? Also, there's a Chazal that says that there's certain things that we do on Rosh Hashanah to confuse the Satan. You know, all of a sudden, he becomes aware that there's a judgment, judgment day and he sort of like uh, loses his uh, calm or whatever and he gets confused and so on. You know, it's to confuse the Satan. That's, that's very difficult to understand. The, the Satan has a tremendous IQ. We know that because he's the Yetzirah and he's the most successful employee ever known because he gets everybody to sin. Clearly he's pretty good at his job, you see. So why should he get confused? He knows every year, <coughs> right, on Aleph Tishrei, there's going to be Rosh Hashanah and there's going to be a Shafer. So what's the problem here? You mean he doesn't remember from year to year? We do, but he doesn't. It's rather hard to understand and so on, you see. Uh, also, what is uh, important is there, we always, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we read the story of the Akeda, when Avraham Avinu took Yitzchak, brought him to Ha Hamoria, Mount Maria, right? And was commanded by God to kill him, sacrifice him. And we read that, you see. So the question then is, okay, we read that because obviously that merit of Avram Avinu bringing his son to die as a response to the commandment of God clearly is a tremendous merit. But when you think about it, you can ask the question, right, what is the real merit of the Akedo? And how can we still have the schos? How can we still have the merit of an event that basically took place 4,000 years ago. I mean, we, we've been uh, relying on the Akeda for 4,000 years. When does it end? Or does the merit ever end? And why does the merit stay with us for so long? You see. And is there any connection between the Akeda and, of course, Rosh Hashanah? And then the, the last thing I would like to <coughs> speak um, a question is, you know, we're facing obviously the purpose of the year is to try to understand uh, but we are facing a judgment day minimally, that's what it is. So if you wanted to ask a defense attorney what should I ask for? How can I, you know, get rid of, so to speak, or be found innocent in the judgment day where I will survive for another year and be prosperous, right? Have health and, and wealth and, uh, and do the will of God, do the mitzvahs. What do I say to God? What's my best defense argument? That's a very good question. Now we have a whole agoda, not agoda, we have a whole tefillah the whole day, a good couple of six, seven hours of prayer and so on, you know? But if you had to boil down, you know, to a, a, a great defense, what would you say? What do you think is the best argument to present to the Rebbe Shalom why you should keep you going for another year? Very important question. In fact, it's probably the most imp uh, important question to ask uh, because it is a judgment day. Anyway, I think I've asked about 12 questions. And uh, my challenge is always, I don't want to answer each question with an individual idea. I want to answer the question with one idea, one concept, one hidden theme that seems to be able to answer, resolve 
every one of the questions. And that's always a tremendous challenge, you see. But then you know that you're on the right track. Because truth always is always able to answer many more than one question because it is the truth. And therefore, it is what's called the ultimate principle of what is going on. <clears throat> so those are the questions. And uh, now let's take a look and see if we can resolve them and so on. <coughs> the first question I ask wasn't out of curiosity. It was very important. What is the event that we celebrate on Rosh Hashanah? Because we know every other holiday, right, we celebrate some event. Obviously on Pesach, we celebrate the Exodus. You see it's Mitzrayim. On Shavuos, it's the giving of the Torah. We know on Purim and Hanukkah, Tisha B'Av, right, Sukkot. Behind each day, there's always some type of event that we celebrate. What is it on Rosh Hashanah? And the idea to that is what? Is this. The event that happened on Rosh Hashanah, right? Is that <clears throat> the tikkun process started. It was initiated. And what is the tikkun process? Basically the divine plan. That's when it started. In other words, what does that mean? The Rosh decided, without going into all the details and so on, he decided <clears throat> that he's going to create <coughs> mankind and he's going to give him a task. And if the person does that task, and of course he's, giving, he's going to give him free will to do the task, if he does the task freely and so on, then he will be worthy to exist eternally with infinite bliss. Future world, Ilm Habo, right? If he doesn't, then the Bashan will do certain things, sort of like to bring him up to speed without getting into that. But the main idea is that this is the beginning of Tikkun. What does that mean? So the Bashan created a situation that man can have a task. If you don't have a situation, if you don't have a deficiency, then obviously there's no task. So he created a universe, a creation, certainly the, this world and so on, that is devoid of the presence of God, which really means that it is devoid of real reality. We don't really see reality, we think we do, but really it's a dream world in a certain sense. There's an illusion here, right, that there's a physical world, right, and we are part of that physical world because we are physical. That's the delusion, really. So God created that delusion, right? And he wants us to understand and believe that no, this world is not physical, even though it looks that way, and so on. But this world is spiritual, right? <coughs> Spirituality or spiritual is a different reality than physical, you see. And he wants us in some way to come to that conclusion to understand what reality really is. And therefore he has created a, a situation called Ilm Hazer, basically. Uh, he has created a world which is physical, material, right? And our task is to see through the delusion or illusion of physicality. And not only that, but not only to see through it in the sense of having a insight and a comprehension that the world is not just physical, looks physical, but what it really is underneath is spiritual, not material. But what's even more interesting is he wants us to behave in this physical world as if it was spiritual. Yeah, that's the interesting part about all this. And when you really think about that, that is the secret of the mitzvahs. You know, we take a look at mitzvahs, and to us, you know, you have to do certain things which are the positive commandments, right? Fine, <coughs> mitzvahs are say. And then there are the negative commandments, right? What we have to avoid. It's called the isurim, those things which are forbidden, you see? But when you ask yourself, wait a minute, what's the underlying reason? What's, what, what are the mitzvahs, the 613 commandments, 
what are they predicated on? And I'll tell you something very interesting. What they are predicated, or the underlying rationale, is these are the behaviors required in a spiritual world. So what the Ramajma has done is he has concealed from us the spiritual world, it looks physical, but he has demanded of us that we commit behaviors which are logically an outgrowth of the spiritual world. Isn't that interesting? You know, in other words, imagine somebody lives on a roof. It's an interesting example. He lives on a roof, right? And that's where he was born. And he's got a whole setup on the roof, right? And that roof is 10 stories, right? But <coughs> he was commanded by his parents who live with him never to go to the edge of the roof. They said, you cannot go to the edge because it's not safe. And this guy never went to the edge. So imagine he basically, his whole life centers around the center of the roof. Never went to the edge. So he doesn't understand what the problem is, right? But he listens to his parents, which is interesting, you see? So you realize something. He is committing a behavior, right? That is not part of his reality. He doesn't know the reality that if you go to the edge of the roof, you may fall, drop through gravity and get yourself killed on the 10th floor. So this guy is actually living on a roof, right? Where there's a reality that he's unaware of. Yet his behavior conforms to the reality of gravity and possibly dying because of gravity. Not interesting? You see? Same thing with mitzvahs. We actually perform mitzvahs, right, that are really not connected so much to this world, although it certainly looks that way. And in a certain sense, we have adapted where the mitzvah is connected to the world, you know, and so on. I mean, you know, for instance, you know, we, we, we eat, we make a bracha, <coughs> you know, so we eat, so that's physical and so on, right? But the bracha is an acknowledgement that the food itself the source of the food is spiritual. It's the Rabbanish Nodim, it's God. You see, that's the secret of a mitzvah. But what's interesting is that when there will be a spiritual world visible, then we will actually see how every mitzvah connects or conforms to that spiritual world. You see, which is very interesting. There's a lot of interesting uh, Ramchal, Ramesh Chaim is on this, you know, where when you are in the reality of the spiritual realities, you will perform mitzvahs, not because you have to, because you want to, because all of a sudden you realize that it's the mitzvahs is the proper behavior that will conform to the reality that I now see. You see, but here we don't see it, so we have free will, you know, and so on, you know. It's like this guy, if he would go to the edge and see the drop, of course he wouldn't go to the edge, especially if it has no railing, you see? He wouldn't have to be commanded not to go to the edge, you know, because maybe he'll fall over and so on. Sats is going to happen the same thing with us in Yemais uh, HaMashiach. Even though there's no mitzvahs, it means that we're not commanded to do any mitzvahs. There's no tzivoy, you see? But we're going to do them anyway. Why? Because that is the reality of the, uh, of the uh, spiritual world that we see, that we realize to conform to this type of reality, you need this behavior. Except now it's not called the mitzvah, it's called the correct behavior. You see what I'm, you see what I'm saying, which is very, very interesting. But in any case, so this process where the bunch of wants to come back into the physical world and make it spiritual and so on is called a tikkun. And it is up to the mankind initially right, <coughs> to bring God back. That's called tikkun. And guess what? That was created, the world was created on the 25th day of Elul, right, which is six days before Aleph Tishrei, basically. And Aleph Tishrei, Odom was created. So now that he's the major operator, right, then of course, once he's the major guy, we can say that the Tikkun started on Aleph Tishrei. You see? So therefore, 
the event that was initiated on the first day of Tishrei, you see, and that's what Rosh Hashanah uh, commemorates and so on, was the creation, not just of the world, but the beginning of the Tikkun process. And that Tikkun process really is for all mankind. So in that sense, <coughs> it's a universal holiday, you see. But obviously, since we took over the Tikkun process, it now means that that is our holiday, because we're the major operators of the Tikkun, the rectification process, you see. So that's it. So we now understand what Rosh Hashanah, the origin of Rosh Hashanah really is. <coughs> like I said, it commemorates the Tikkun itself, which in many ways is a universal holiday, but certainly since the Jews are the major operators, the ones who, who completes and fulfills the Tikkun process, it is certainly uh, a day of, of ourselves and so on, you see. And besides, what is also important to know, which I once mentioned a long time ago, is that there's a tremendous mistake. It is true that Odomarishan is not Jewish, but that's because of something which most people never heard of. Because in the beginning of time, what the Russian wanted is that all mankind, there was no such thing as Jew or Goy, all mankind should do the Tikkun process. So therefore, Odomarishan was not Jewish, you see. But Odom was something else. He was a Yisrael, because the word Yisrael refers to somebody who has a certain type of neshama that he can do the tikkun. And Adam Rishon had that neshama. So he wasn't Jewish because it wasn't given over to the Jews. It was really the whole concept of doing the tikkun was given over to mankind, which is interesting. It was only with the introduction of Avram Avinu, when the whole world refused to obey the will of God, which we know, the Doha Mabel, the flood, the Doha Flogga, the generation of dispersion. It was only when the Bersham said, I'm giving it over to you, Avram Avinu, to do the Tikkun, which I had originally given to all mankind, but I'm now <coughs> going to take it away and give it only to you exclusively and your descendants. You see, so that's also the concept that Rosh Hashanah is the holiday of Yisrael. And since, and Yisrael means somebody who could do the tikkun, even if it's, we're not an, it wasn't given over to Hebrews and Ivri, you see. But now since we took over the concept of Yisrael, appropriately, it's also our holiday too. So that's also a very important idea, and there's a lot to talk about that. <clears throat> In any case, <clears throat> so what is important to know that if there is a tikkun process, right, and as a result of the tikkun process, right, we have to do the mitzvahs because that's how we do the tikkun and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So we now know that there are basically three series of actions that God does that involves Him in, in, in the tikkun process itself. One of them is called Anhogas Hakiyum. It is the acts of God or the behavior of God as it involves Him creating the whole setup for the test. The whole setup. Kia means to, f to uh, establish or to fulfill. So in order to give us a situation where we can be tested, he creates the entire creation. And everything uh, is part of that, the Hanhoga. So that's the Hanhoga Sakiyam. That is called the, uh, the behavior of God or the actions of God, right? Whose purpose is to create a setup or a test situation for us to be in in order to do the tikkun. And the mitzvahs, of course, concern some aspect of interacting with the physical setup. Because every mitzvah, in many ways, is physical, and so on. So that's called the Anagas Hakim. That's what the Bernsham did. Okay. Now, so the Bernsham now waits. <coughs> what does he wait? What are we going to do? So he puts us into a test situation, and then we follow through whatever, whatever we want to do, right? And then he's mishpat, he judges us. Well, did we do the test? Did we fulfill? Or we failed, we did the sin. We didn't do what we had to do, and so on. So he judges us. 
That's called mishpat. Then hagas mishpat. You see. And Rosh Hashanah is the major day, right, on the first day of Tishrei, that the world is judged, and so on. The concept of mishpat, you see. Mm. Then there's a third series of actions, which are, uh, the Rosham does, we, and we are not aware of how it works and so on. And that is called, the Ramchal calls it, the Anhogah Sayyichod. It's the actions of God as He is supreme, which means he can do whatever he wants. He can violate justice because there's nothing that stands in his way at all, and so on. So that's called Anhogas HaYichud. How it works, why it works, is very mysterious. We have no idea, but somehow it saves the Jews. And even if they don't really, in many ways, deserve the future world, they get it anyway through this Hanhoga. God makes them deserve it and so on, without getting into all the details. So there you are. Three actions of God as relates to the Tikkun process. The Anhogas HaKiyum, to create, to set up, which is this physical world. The Anhogas HaMishpat, to judge mankind, right, based on what they've been subjected to and what is their results, and so on. That's the judgment itself. And then, there's Anhogas HaYichud, which is sort of like a backup system to guarantee that the Jewish people will be in Ulam Haba uh, eternally with infinite bliss. Now, obviously, those are the interactions, and they're all of the necessity of Tikkun. You see, they all follow logically from what the whole day commemorates. <clears throat> but think about this for a minute. <clears throat> Imagine you open up a store, right? on January 2nd, right? You're selling goods, right? Isn't it like, well, now why are you selling goods? Because you want to make money, right? You have the goods, you're hoping people come in and buy from the store, and, and so on. Isn't it logical that after a certain amount of time, you're gonna have to evaluate the business? Am I making money or am I not making money, right? Not only that, do I have too many goods in the store? Is my inventory too much or it's too little? What about my supply? You know, are they still, is it still coming in or is there a shortage of goods and so on? Is my department running efficiently, the departments of my store and so on? Obviously, you need what's called an evaluation of the entire operation of owning and making money from a store. Obviously, well, if you think about it, isn't that the same logic? What the Bansham needs to do, since he knows exactly how much is necessary to do the tikkun, right? When Jews do the mitzvahs, <coughs> how much do they have to do? What type of mitzvahs? What countries do they live in? And how will they be tested? Over what and so on? It's almost like a myriad of ideas and tests that they have to go through in you know, order to ultimately do the tikkun process. Well, don't you think it needs an evaluation? Basically, you think uh, every periodic, periodically, let's say every year, annually, there's always a day when you look at what's going on with the business. You evaluate the business. So just like a store owner would do that, right, or any company owner, the Rabbanisham, the Rabbanisham also has to evaluate his business. You see, and his business is what? Is getting the world ready for Yemoisa Mashiach, Messianic era, and Oilem Habo. So he's also got to evaluate what? The status of the Tikkun. How far are we ahead? Are we close to the end? Are we in the middle? Did the Jews sin grievously and therefore we now have to redo some of the Tikkun? You see, you need an entire ad adjustment of, and an first you need an evaluation. What's the status of Tikkun? Where's it standing? How close are we to the end? How far are we away? And so on, right? So you need the evaluation of the Tikkun status. Then what you need is a readjustment. Okay, now what do I do? So the readjustment can be what? In order to advance, basically, the Tikkun. Now that readjustment is scary because it looks at the world as a whole, then it looks at the Jewish people as a whole, 
Then it looks at each individual Jew. What is each one contributing to the Tikkun process? That's what it looks at, you see. How are they contributing to the Tikkun process? And so on. And then all of a sudden the Rebbe says, well, they didn't do enough, or they sinned, or they backtracked, or whatever. So I have to now change the situation of a country, right? Or of the entire Jewish people, or of an individual. So everything changes and has to readjust to the requirements of advancing the Tikkun process. That's what happens on Rosh Hashanah. You see, uh, it's not that you, it's not that, which is very interesting, it's not that, you know, the person himself is evaluated. Is he guilty? Is he innocent? Does he have merits? And so on, that will get him into the future world. That anyway happens. But that's not the thrust of Rosh Hashanah. The Rosh Hashanah is about where God looks at the person and he says, okay, what have you done? for the Tikkun process, because every Jew contributes to the Tikkun process in his unique way. And therefore what the Rosham judges is where are you at in the Tikkun process? If you've done many mitzvahs or schusim, right, and so on, right? So the Rosham will say, well, I will improve your lot because you're doing the top process, right? Or I will change your lot, you see? So until now you're worth what? You're worth $5 billion? Guess what? You're not doing anything. You need to change your situation in order to now accommodate uh, you to be able to further the Tikkun process of your own chilek, your own part or contribution. So guess what? I'm going to make you lose $5 million this year. And you are now going to be a poor man because poverty is what you need for you to advance the Tikkun process in terms of what your mission was. So that's the way it works. And that's frightening. Because who wants to go from being a multimillionaire to being somebody on the welfare rolls? Obviously. Uh, but that's what the Basham does. He judges you. It's not so much, well, are you guilty or innocent in terms of doing mitzvahs or sinning? He judges you <coughs> based on your contribution and your advancement to your part in the Tikkun process. That's what happens on Rosh Hashanah. You see, it's an annual assessment of the entire Tikkun status, of the entire creation. And he looks at you individually, where do you fit? And he alters your situation to accommodate your new role. And not only to the Jew, he does that to the family. And he does that to the whole neighborhood the whole city and the whole country you see so all of a sudden if the Russian sees that they're not doing the job for instance I'll give you an example Spain <clears throat> right 1492 the Jews get kicked out of Spain because they want to try to convert all the Jews you know and everybody's familiar of course with the Spanish Inquisition and so on <clears throat> but the main idea is that obviously the Russian decided well they've been in Spain for over a thousand years and boy, have they assimilated. You know, now they're all getting what's called haciendas, these fancy estates and so on, you know. This is no good. I'm going to kick him out of Spain. So, of course, he instigates, what was his name, Ferdinand and Isabella, those two people, tremendous reshoim, how evil can you get, and so on. But in any case, uh, so he decided he's going to evict the Jews from Spain. But it wasn't one person was the whole Jewish population, which was terrible. <clears throat> Why? Why did the Bershom do that? You see, because he's using Ferdinand and Isabella as an instrument to alter the Tikkun contribution of the Jewish people in Spain. Now, we don't understand that because we have no idea what's involved, the status. We have no idea of the accomplishment that they did or that they didn't do. But whatever we see is that this historical event radically altered the situation of the Jewish people. You see? Because from Spain, right? Then they went to the rest of Europe, and then you had Eastern Europe and so on. And they went to Italy, and then they went back to Israel. That's where Sephardim come from, basically from Spain and so on. See? 
that's a classic example of how the Bansham alters right the situation of the Jews as a whole because he deemed it necessary and the only way is I got to get them out of Spain or they'll never do their Tikkun process their chilek, their contribution I got to get them out put them in another country and begin the process in a different way that's a small example <clears throat> now the entire history right is replete with this of why people's situations change because it's all about advancing tikkun and putting you in the right place that you could do the tikkun you see nothing is an accident everything is measured down to the nanometer so to speak you know what you need to do to get you into the tikkun mode <coughs> and successful tikkun you see uh, and so on so that's what he does that's what Rosh Hashanah really is it is an evaluation of the tikkun process itself and where you fit the country fits the Jewish people fit and so on now that makes sense we understand that makes sense any business will have to have to check their inventory and obviously they're going to look at the individual staff well I got a you know I'm selling something right so you, you as the boss are going to sit down in your private chambers and you have let's say 10 workers you're going to look at each worker not in terms of is he doing his job good or not is he, is he contributing to the sale of my merchandise that's really what you have that's why you're evaluating your worker <clears throat> you see now of course based on how good he is in selling the merchandise right that's how good you will act to him in terms of giving him a reward or whatever or firing him or whatever same thing because the job of the Jew the reward that he gets is because of his contribution to the tikkun that's exactly what it is so there are two things going on here there's the tikkun process itself which is the overall job and the second thing is what do you what's your role in that process and that is your merit to get ilim haba so there's really a, a very interestingly a whole concept of duality here <clears throat> now <clears throat> that's you know, we understand the logic of this you see it's like any business like i said any business would do this except the reevaluation takes place on olive tishrei in any case now <clears throat> what's interesting is this but wait a minute you know what the Bersham can do th theoretically and that's what they do so you know, he can go into wherever he goes his private chamber so to speak right and sit down and in a nanosecond like the commissioner says Peskira achas which is incredible you know in other words he looks at <coughs> the totality of creation in one instant all of it right and he evaluates all of it in an instant every department of the creation which is trillions of departments he evaluates every atom every molecule every insect every human everything from the beginning of creation to the end and he can do it he can evaluate it in a, in a, in a nanosecond all of it at one time which is incredible there's no mind there's no ai nothing can do that but we talk about the rabbin Islam. and that's what he could do and then you know the day comes he evaluates and it's over right he doesn't have to tell anybody right nobody would ever know the difference the Rosham does it in his way and that's it everything's really evaluated and he decides in that instant the entire adjustment that is necessary fine you know if you think about that wait a minute you know well it's not is it really fair why not give the guy a warning and say listen you know uh, I don't like what you're doing you're not contributing to the overall uh, purpose of the whole business and so on you know let me give you a warning I give you 10 days to shape up or you're gonna ship out right and then the guy's gonna say wait a minute I want this job right I don't want to leave it you know this guy, this guy's a great boss and so on you know thank you for telling me that you're about to evaluate me so what the Russian decides which is an unbelievable act of chesed 
Now you begin to understand what the Baruch Hashem does. He does this incredible act of kindness, chesed, where he says, you know, I don't need to tell anybody. When, when I mean tell anybody, anybody means nobody. Nobody in all creation knows what's going on in the mind of God. And that's all he needs is an instant time, and that's, it's over. And then the Baruch Hashem will issue his commandments. He doesn't want to do that. Because really he loves the Jewish people, you see. And he wants them to be an Oilam Habo. He wants them to do the Tikkun. He wants to bring the Mashiach, right? And stop all this incredible madness of which we all see is going on today and so on. So how? So he says, well, you know what I'm going to do? <coughs> I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them that they're all in the hot seat. Which means, right, that I'm going to evaluate everybody. And I'm going to tell them, like this, to have a warning, you see? That's a tremendous act of chesed that the Baruch Hashem does. He doesn't have to tell anybody. But he says, no, why? Why am I going to tell them? Because I want them to know what's about to happen, and I want them to influence the verdict. I want to, them to hopefully change their ways, right? Uh, and they themselves will change their ways in the right way, and therefore, I don't have to alter their situations, and so on. I can give them blessing, right? Instead of curses or whatever, and so on, right? Uh, and therefore, I want them to influence the verdict. You see? That's a chesed, which is unbelievable, that he told us. So when does this chesed begin? Well, it begins as we, what we do is, v'shchidish elul. So take a look at the chesed. I'll give you a month to, sh to shape up. Hello, right? Uh, because on Aleph Tishrei, it's going to be a judgment day. You see? So I'm giving you one month. Hello. Right? Whatever. And so on and so forth. Wow. Unbelievable. And of course, Elo comes, and then with their slichas for this father, and then the Ashkenazim and the slichas later on, and everybody's now mindful. All yeshivas begin... And hopefully uh, people are mindful and so on, and they begin thinking of tshuva, which is really uh, how we shape up. Tshuva, we do repentance. Why? Right? Because we want to now have a greater role and a greater success in contributing to the tikkun process, you see. So Elul is the first chesed, right? Then comes Rosh Hashanah, the judgment. But we say, uh-oh, the judgment, we didn't do enough for Elul, bad news. So the Rosh Hashanah says, no, I'm going to allow an appeal process, right? You know, in America, there's an appeal. You went to court, you lost, you were found guilty. So there's what's called an appeals court, right? Where you can question the judgment and maybe bring in new evidence or have somebody else look at it, whatever, you know? So obviously, there's no appeal. It's not like you can go to some angelic lawyer company you get the gate the Malachim to go check on the works of God. No. But what it is is the Bosham says, you know, even though I've judged you, let's say, and it's not a great judgment, right? You know, it's to the detriment of yourself and your family, whatever. I'll give you ten days, another ten days after Rosh Hashanah, right? Got got another ten days to do tshuva. You see? In other words, I I, I will issue the judgment but I will not sign. <coughs> I'm going to sign on the 10th day. What a chesed. That even though Rosh Hashanah is the judgment itself, but the Rabbani Shalom God does not sign the document, you see, the decree, and so on. And he lets you, he gives you nine days, plus the 10th, which is Yom Kippur. So what he does is Yom Kippur is now, right? So first you had El, then you had the judgment, <coughs> without a signature. Right? And then you have the 10 days of Aser Tshuva, which is another incredible chesed, because the Rabban Shem is rooting for you by giving you the warning. But then wait a minute, you see? And then after Yom Kippur, what the Rabban Shem does is he now signs Chasima, he signs the document. <coughs> so you would say, uh-oh, if he's signing the document, then it's over. So the Rabban Shem says, no. I will even extend that, right, to Hashanah Rabbah. And that's when I seal the document and so on. So look how many days we have, right? 
we've got a whole bunch of, I think it's 23 days, right? 23 days, uh, and that's from Rosh Chodesh uh, Tishrei. We really have, what, another 29 days from Elo and so on, you know? So think about that. It's like 53 days of be, being warned to do tshuva so you can now contribute in the in in best way to uh, the tikkun process. You see the logic of it, you see? All of this is designed to help the Jew with these ideas and so on. You see? Sounds great, doesn't it? We now understand it's almost like a soapbox serial, you know, a series of actions where you now understand the logic why there is Rosh Hashanah, why it has to be, like I said, the analogy of a business, <coughs> you know, and not only that, once it is, fine, that the Rosh Hashanah does a tremendous act of chesed, and what is that act of chesed? He warns you, you know, all the days and different ways and so on to do tshuva. And not only that, what the Rav Hashem also does is he, is he leaves his courtroom and comes amongst the people. He's very near us. He wants us to do tshuva. So that itself, when the judge himself comes into our city to coax us <laughs> to do tshuva, that's what it is basically and so on, you know. So that's incredible what Rosh Hashanah really is. Aha. But there's a monumental problem. Monumental problem. I mean, we are tremendously thankful for the tremendous chesed, kindness that God did before judging. I'm, I'm talking here only by judging a person or even a country or a nation. I'm judging, talking about judging the entire creation because that's all of it is involved in the tikkun process. In fact, everything that exists, exists only because it can contribute to the tikkun process. Now, we don't understand that. For instance, <clears throat> just as an example, there are 300,000 species of beetles. I don't know if you know that. Not 300,000 beetles. There are trillions of beetles. I've, 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 you know, some probably people are wondering, yeah, and they're all crawling in my basement. But in any case, mm, there are 300,000 species of beetles. That means each beetle looks different, right? Why? You mean the world couldn't exist? There was 299,999? <coughs> and the answer is, no, it couldn't. Now we have no idea of the chokhmah of the Bria, the unbelievable infinite wisdom that goes into this. We don't even understand the wisdom, wisdom of a single individual species. If you ever look at, you know, some of the biology of what animals are made of and how they defend themselves and so on, you realize this is beyond chance. Only an incredible supermind could create this. But in any case, you see, so everything that exists, exists only because it contributes to the taking process. Now, but there's a tremendous problem that the Russian has. I mean, not that he has a problem, of course not. But from our perspective, there is a problem. What is that? Because wait a minute, if you would have gone to your private chamber and sat there, <clears throat> right, and did your evaluation in that nanosecond, fine. Well, nobody knows. So who's going to protest? Nobody. But now that you've advertised, right, and publicized, <clears throat> <coughs> right now that you've advertised and publicized the fact that you are going to judge the world the Sutton knows the Sutton the Bershom has alerted the Sutton that by the way there's going to be a mishpat there's going to be a court case right and we know that what that in a court case right that everybody's there the defense attorneys the prosecuting attorneys and so on including the DA of heaven who is the Sutton so wait a minute guess what he's going to sit up there during the court trial of Rosh Hashanah and he's going to make a katrig. he is now going to prosecute that's exactly what he's going to do this is bad news you see uh, so it's great that you did the chesed of informing us but now everybody's informed right because now it's all publicized and so on so what do we do You've awakened our greatest enemy to prosecute us, which is Sutton. 
So the Rabban Shalom says, that was, his, that was the Rabban Shalom's challenge. So the Shalom says, don't worry, I will solve the problem. I will institute a mitzvah that if you do, it stops the sultan. How? Because I will leave the courtroom and go into my private chambers. What is that mitzvah? Shoifer. Now you understand what a shoifer does. Uh, you see, in fact, if you take a look at the psukim that we read right before we blow shofar, the first letters of that six verses is Korah Sotan, God tears. <coughs> God tears the Sotan, you see. So the underlying real reason for the shofar is to stop the Kitrugim, is to stop the what? The prosecutions of the Sotan. That's why you have a shofar. And so on, you see. So we now understand what is going on, and so on. In any case, we understand the sequence of ideas of what ultimately gives rise to that which we all have to do, you see. Mm. Uh, now, let me take a look at the original questions, and we will see that all of them could be answered. What is the essence of Rosh Hashanah? I have mentioned. The essence is to commemorate a universal holiday, which is now a Jewish holiday, and that is to do the Tikkun itself. And that's what Rosh Hashanah is, right? Why is Rosh Hashanah? So we realize it's not a real judgment in the sense where you are evaluated. Are you guilty or innocent? It looks at your contribution to the Tikkun process, and based on that, <coughs> and based on that, that is the judgment itself. Where do I place you in order for you to continue to advance? Maybe you need a kapora, maybe you need an atonement, and so on. What's the best position to be in to advance the process? Why is it only one day a year, but it's not? Because Chazal tell us that a person is judged every day, which makes sense. God looks at the acts of a person the entire day, right, at night and so on, whatever, when the neshama goes up and so on, and uh, each day, but he only evaluates the entire creation only once a year, which makes sense, because if he alters the situation of a person, right, then he has to alter it and allow it to unfold for a year. So every day God judges a person immediately on is he guilty or innocent, in terms of the sins of the mitzvahs. But, in terms of evaluating creation, he only does that once a year. And that's why judgment is only once a year. Why is everything judged? Sure, everything is judged in terms of how, do, how does each thing now contribute to the tikkun? And it doesn't make a difference if you have free will or not. Since the main objective of God is to advance the tikkun process, since that's the main idea, right? Therefore, everything is judged in terms of where will it be placed and what will its situation be in order to advance the, uh, the tikkun process. So it, it doesn't make a difference if you have free will. Even for those beings that have no free will, where will they be placed? You see, maybe the Rebunshim will decide that it needs a swarm of locusts, right? to come through Africa or whatever because so locusts, what do they have to do with this and so on, right? They're not guilty of anything. But the Moshim, let's say, may determine that I need to punish this nation so therefore I will move all the locusts to swarm in that country. You see, that's why everything is judged in terms of where do I have to place them and what situation do they have to be in, right? In order to do advance the Tikkun process. <clears throat> why all of Tishrei? Because Aleph Tishrei is the beginning of the Tikkun process of the Marishim. Before Adam, first man, there is no process, they're just a setup. But with the birth of Adam, or the creation of Adam, I should say, <coughs> right, uh, that was on Aleph Tishrei. So therefore, Aleph Tishrei is the annual judgment period. Just like a business will judge it based annually on probably when he opened. Why is it a Yom Tuf? Ah, the reason why it's a Yom Tuf, because even though we are judged based on <coughs> how we contributed to the Tikkun, right? But we know in the end, what is the end really all about? The end is to be in Oilim Haba, right? Eternally, with infinite bliss. 
And we know that ultimately God has put in actions that guarantee our survival. <coughs> For instance, <coughs> the Anhogas HaYichud, which we know, and even on Rosh Hashanah you have the Shofa that guarantees that we will survive because God moves from the chamber of ju judgment he moves to the chamber his private chambers and nobody knows what he does and it's between him and the Jewish people and the Sutton is shut out of that obviously because it's not the courtroom and so on you see so that is why it's a yontif because we know in the end we will be victorious you see it's like somebody's being judged right and there's a jury so he walks over to the judge, right? And the judge happens to be his father. So how worried can he be, right? Because uh, he knows his father will find him innocent. Same thing. We know ultimately God wants to find us all innocent. So God is going to make moves that clearly get us into Oilam Habo. That's why we're not really concerned. I mean, in a certain sense, we are because we don't even want God to change our situation right to accommodate a new Tikkun advancement but we know in the end the main thing is that we will be in Oilam Habo experiencing God you see <clears throat> now also I asked right why Shoifa because Shoifa is a device right that undoes the problem of the sudden knowing and therefore being Makatreg since God wanted to tell us what he's doing you see Shoifa is that device and as a result of that, that device is what quiets the Sutton by God leaving the courtroom, the official courtroom, and going into his private chambers where there is no kitrug at all. <clears throat> now we have three major themes, which I said. And those themes are our argument, right? Malchios. We try to declare God as king, because what we say, God, you are our king, we want to do tshuva. Uh, until now, we disobeyed you. And now we want to follow the mitzvahs and so on. So that's our first claim. We crown God, we coronate him as king. Second idea is zechreinus. What we say is even if you find our intent lacking, but zechreinus, remember the good deeds that we did do and let that be to us for a merit. And shoifreis is what we say to the Rebbe no, please, you know, go into your private chambers, right? Shoifer, into your private chambers, and you decide what you want to do with us without a kitrug, without the prosecutions. So therefore you can exercise mercy in that courtroom because there's nobody to contest what you're doing, you see? So that's why we say psukum of, of <coughs> shoifa. Why does the uh, shoifa have crying, the sounds of crying? Because that's really our expression. The shoifa is requesting God, right? Please exercise Hanogas HaYichud and exercise Rachmanus. See, so what we are doing is crying and begging God, pleading with God to save us, you see. <clears throat> Why is the Sutton confused? In the end, he's not confused, really. He's confounded. Sutton knows what's going on. In fact, he's the prosecuting attorney. But he's hoping that we will not blow Shoifa. So if we don't blow Shoifa, right, then God does not leave that chamber and go to his private chambers which means that uh, we have the Sutton right prosecuting us you see so the Sutton doesn't become confused he knows exactly what's happening but he's confounded he's hoping that we do not blow shofar and the Gemara says that any city that doesn't blow shofar is going to have a very bad year again because their court case has remained in the public arena and God has not gone into the private chambers you see <clears throat> now if we ask ourselves you know uh, what's the best taina and best taina really is something which comes from the akeda and that's why we read the akeda <clears throat> it's uh, I gave a whole share on this uh, quite, a, quite a while ago on what the real meaning of the akeda is but what it really boils down to is this and this is ultimately what we have to argue with God and so on. <clears throat> what is that? What the Akedah did, and we, we will understand why he did that. Why did he ask Avram to kill? Because what the Barsham did is he appeared to Avram, Avram Avinu, right, as irrational, because it doesn't make sense. 
you said you said that what's going to happen is my seed will develop through Yitzchak, right? That means the continuity of the Jewish people will be through Yitzchak. Now you want me to kill him? That's completely irrational. It's impossible. You know, it's tanti de sastre, as they say. Those are two mutually exclusive items. So therefore, God is appearing to Avram irrational. Why would God want to do that? And the answer is because there will come a time, and that's why it's the last Nisoyan test, there will come a time when the Jews have sinned terribly according to God's understanding and so on, you see, and therefore they will have no merits. None. Very hard to believe. But there are, when I mean Jews, I mean all the Jews. Obviously there are Jews that do have merits, many of them. But there will be a number of Yidin, whatever the percentage is, that have, do not have sufficient merits to survive into the Messianic era or into Ilam Habo. So how does God save them? So that's why he commanded Avram Avinu to destroy, to kill his son. Why? Because he wanted to show, and Rashi actually says this over there in Akedah, you know, now I know that you fear God. What does that mean? So Rashi says, why did the Rabbanu Shem do that to Avram, command him to kill his son? Because he wanted to demonstrate the following. Because someday the Sutton and the nations of the world are going to come to the God in court and say, we don't understand. <coughs> Why are you giving them Oilam Habo? Why do you love them so much? Look how much they're sinning. And God is going to say, you're right, they are sinning, but I'll tell you why I will not abandon them. Because even though I appear to them as irrational, doesn't even make sense, they will not abandon me. They have incredible loyalty to me. They will not abandon me. So measure for measure. Justice says, well, if they don't abandon you, no matter how you appear to them, it just shows ultimately what they think of you. And they're still loyal to you. So how could you abandon them? And God will tell that to the Sutton and to the nations of the world. The reason why I love the Jews is because even though they have, <coughs> even though they have no merits, right? They will not abandon me, no matter how I appear to them. And therefore, as a result of that, I will never abandon them, measure for measure. You know where we see that, really? <clears throat> By the sin of the golden calf, the Chet Egel. <coughs> where the Rabban Shem says what? He says the following, I should say Moshe Rabbeinu says, Mi la Shem Eli, after Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu threw down the tablets, right? He says to the Jews, who is unto God, right? Mila Shem, who is unto God? A lie, come to me. What he should have said, who, whoever did not sin with the golden calf, come to me. He doesn't say that. He says, whoever is to God, come to me. Which means that it's okay, it's true you sin. But the, the real test, or the bottom line is, even though you sinned, are you still loyal to God? You see, Mil Hashem, who is unto God, a lie, come to me. The greatest merit a Jew has is where a Jew, in some capacity, will not abandon God. In a certain capacity, he feels proud to be Jewish, or he does actions which clearly, <coughs> which clearly convey his loyalty to the Rabbi Islam. And that is the Akedah, you see. And in the end, that's what the greatest merit of all and that's the merit that we have to say to God, it's true I have sinned. And we say all the chator, chotosi, that I have sinned, achet uh, and I have sinned this sin and this sin and this sin. But the key in the end, it's true you've sinned. God ex knows that everybody's going to sin. That's the human condition. But what he wants is, okay, what's the result of the sinning? Are you going to abandon me? and allow yourself to be swallowed up in Oilam Hazeh, in a physical world, or you're going to say, listen, I sinned, I fell, but I'm going to get up again, because in the end, <coughs> because in the end, I still want you, you see. I still want to remain loyal to you. That is the schus, the merit of the Akedah, you see. It's not just because of Rome's action, that's not what it is. It's true, Avraham Avinu did an incredible thing for which we have been deserving of merit for a thousand years, whatever. 
But the real merit comes from the symbolism of that akeda, that act, that we will not, just like he never abandoned God, the Jewish people throughout history, at one time or another, will not abandon God. So the merit of the arcade is ongoing. It's not once and we're deriving merit from that. Uh, it's in every generation where the Jews are moise nefesh. They do acts which are really incredible. Mesiris nefesh, self-sacrifice. And they are the ongoing arcade. You see, that's the concept of the arcade. And therefore, when God hears the shofar, right? And the shofar is a ram's horn, right? And that's what Avram Avinu offered on the Mizbeach, a ram. It, so to speak, is an argument to God, remember the ram's horn. Remember what Avram Avinu did, that you use his argument, or you use his Messiah's nefesh, that he, will never, that he never abandon you, and he's willing to kill his son just to satisfy your commandment. And that's the incredible loyalty that, <coughs> that he has. So please remember that loyalty that we also exhibit and therefore save us, no matter what it takes, you see? So that's why the crying, even if you have to uh, condemn us to suffering, Yisurin, suffering, right? In order to get us into Oil Mahaba, do it. Because in the end, the whole process must wind up in Oilam Haba, which is eternal, right? Eternal reward, infinitely, re re infinite reward, mm -hmm. eternally. And that's what, why the Shofet reminds us of the Akeda and quiets the Sutton. Because God said, and that's his argument against the Sutton, they don't abandon me, how could I abandon them? You see, <coughs> now you understand how the Shofet works, the mechanism that reminds God of the whole concept or it presents the argument of the concept of loyalty which was demonstrated initially by Avram Avino. And that is the argument that we use, the crying of the Shafer, that even if you have to give us suffering and it doesn't make sense to us, like the Holocaust. The Holocaust doesn't make any sense. Why would God allow the Germans to do this? You see, but the Jews never gave up. There were Jews that did, but there are how many Jews did not give up and in the trains themselves on the way to Auschwitz and so on how many Jews said whatever you do to me God I'm loyal to you I will never abandon uh, you and, and, and so on you know so that's why the shofar works reminds of the Akeda so the Akeda is a critical piece of the defense that the Jews have against the Sutton okay I have now gone through many, many questions of Rosh Hashanah. I hope it all makes sense. Rosh Hashanah is an incredible holiday. You see that uh, the entire universe, all creation, is judged, you see. But you understand now that Rosh Hashanah is a distinctly Jewish holiday, even though it doesn't look that way, you see. And you now understand the sequence of ideas that comprise what Rosh Hashanah is. So I wish everybody a tremendous new year and that the Mashiach should come this year and end the incredible madness that the world has descended into, the tremendous tumor of this world. Now we should reunite with the Bersham as our true Father in Heaven. Thank you.